Our guest this week is a dear friend of mine and one of my favorite people to talk NFL draft, but also football in general. We've had him on uh, before on the season with Peter Schrager. He is the executive director of the Reese's Senior Bowl. He's an 18 year NFL scout and he's a four time Super Bowl champion as a front office member. Mr. Jim Nagy, welcome back to the season with Peter Schrager. Peter, thanks for having me back on. Uh, it's going to be fun. Yes, it is going to be fun. We are less than a month away. We are now officially in April, and I plan on having you on multiple times uh, in the lead-up of the draft. But I specifically wanted to have you on because of a tweet that I put out yesterday morning that I didn't realize would cause a maelstrom of, of <laughs> vitriol, uh, support, uh, attention. I have been asked to go on no less than 20 different talk radio shows over the last 48 hours over a tweet that I had. In fact, I will read you my tweet that I had as it's, I think it's the last tweet I've put out there. And if you're not on Twitter, I'm sure uh, you can gather what I was referring to. Here's my tweet. April 1st spoke to and texted multiple scouts and GMs about North Carolina state big man, DJ Burns as an NFL offensive tackle prospect over the last 24 hours. Fact I did. He is listed at six, nine, but he's probably six, seven. He's got a plus footwork would get a big turnout and potentially money. If he participated in a pro day or workout the week after the final four by potentially money, I meant could get drafted or could get signed as a, as a, undrafted free agent. I put that tweet out, not thinking anything of it. It has 12 million impressions, <laughs> 2. 2.4 thousand reposts and over a thousand comments. Most of them assuming it was either an April fool's gag, or I am some sort of uh, idiot for suggesting as much, which is what is the nature of, of online. Now, yesterday, <laughs> Yesterday, Jim Nagy, who I trust more than anybody when it comes to NFL draft and scouting and the like, posts the following tweet. Got text from a GM, an assistant GM, and a college director within an hour of posting this last Friday night. There is NFL interest in DJ Burns, and it is a real thing. And last Friday night, you posted someone said, anyone else having trouble watching NC State big man DJ Burns and not thinking about him kick sliding and pass protection or getting out on poles? Can't just be me. And then few hours later yesterday you wrote i don't do lame april fool's posts jim the reaction to your tweet suggesting him as just a potential offensive lineman in the nfl was what well a couple of things here first peter like mine got a lot of traction but not 12 million uh like yours did i don't have quite the following uh man i just you know it's kind of a sickness for football people you can't watch you can't watch hoops without your brain going to what could this guy be on a football field. And so, yeah, I threw that out last Friday night. And again, three buddies hit me up. Like, Hey man, I'm watching the game. I was thinking the same thing. Um, so many things have to happen for this guy to be a football player. I'm not saying he's going to be on an NFL football field next fall. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but with that frame, with that body type, I'm with you. They list him at six, nine. I'm, I'm guessing NFL scouts would probably get him at six, seven. Yep. He's probably not the 275 he's listed at. He's probably north of three bills. Yep. Um, but it's just an exercise you do, man. You watch, you watch, you know, kind of a long 6'3 guard with long arms, d and guys up and with great movement, lateral movement and, and reactiveness. I mean, you you think, oh, well, what that guy looked like at a corner, corner right? Sure. So, so, yeah, I mean, I just threw that out in the middle of March Madness because um, I don't watch a lot of basketball anymore. Yeah. Um, and saw this DJ Burns guy doing his thing. And uh, it's kind of blown up. I mean, I, so yes. So yesterday, Bleacher Report picked up my thing. And next thing you know, my son texts me like, hey, dad, you're in our you're in our uh, buddy's group chat right now. Like, what's going on? <laughs> so it's been yeah, it's been kind of crazy. It's a perfect storm of a little bit of a lull in the draft season. And then this incredible Cinderella ride and you and I as football people. And I saw several different football people and my phone also blowing up with not just NFL fan at GMs saying <laughs> I would do anything to get my hands on just to see what a raw, you know? So what really spurred my tweet was, I don't know his title. He's at a organization. He's been there for years and he's the number two guy there. I don't know the official title. I said to him, am I crazy? And that this guy 
could have a pro day workout and NFL teams would flock to it. And he said, yeah, a hundred percent NFL teams would flock to it. And he could make quite a bit of money. And he started listing names. He was like Jai Lewis at George Mason was not even close to as mobile and as gifted footwork wise as this guy. And he got a tryout and teams showed up and you go through it, whether it be Mo Ali Cox or whether it be uh, in recent years, George Fant at a Western Kentucky, there is a place in the Rico gathers at a Baylor. These were college basketball players in the tournament. And maybe it makes NFL Luddites and NFL knuckleheads like us look like we're, you know, our heads in the sand that it takes an NCAA tournament run to notice these guys because at Winthrop, he was the conference player of the year. It's not like he wasn't doing it, but sometimes on the grand stage, when you have a performance like this, it does open eyes and people start thinking in football terms and I will put my name on it. And I think I'm pretty reliable on this stuff. If he was to have a pro day next week, there would be teams that would show up. And I think there might be a full arsenal of teams showing up. Am I wrong? You are 100% right, Peter, just to unpack a couple of those things, those names you talked about. Um, when I was with the Seahawks, we had Mo Ali Cox walk in the halls on a 30 visit this time of year after his pro day, he was up into the building. We drafted George, or no, we got George uh, Fan as an undrafted free agent. If I could go back, like I got to hit up some guys in Seattle to see if they can yeah. send me the his pro day video. Let me hear. He so, down- so he's at Western Kentucky. He played, I want to say one year of college ball. He did play football, right? He did. He put on a helmet, He ba- but he barely played. He okay. barely played. And, and we put him through a tight end workout at the pro day. And all I remember is the red zone drill. They were throwing him red zone fades. And here's this guy that's like at the time, 280 pounds, maybe just getting off the ground. It was unbelievable. The body control, the leaping ability. And, you know, long story short now, whatever it is, 10 years later, he's been in the league forever and he's been a tackle. They, you know, we, we put a bunch of weight on him. Um, and George had a great NFL career. I mean, yeah. the guy started, I started a ton of games. So no, the, the league would show up. And the other thing I'll say, after all this stuff happened yesterday and all this, your stuff's catching fire, yeah. um, a buddy of mine who's a scout that lives in the, the research triangle there in North Carolina, really close to Raleigh, he texted me. He was like, man, you are killing me right now with these tweets. He's like, that his, was his, plan, secret? His, his hope, his hope was NC State gets bounced in the first round or in the first couple rounds. Yep. And then he was going to try to sneak in and get over there and work him on himself and you know, stash the guy away and, and sign him after the draft. He's like, well, now that's not that's not in the in the cards because you're right. If if they had a pro day, man, over half the league would probably be there, I would guess. Yeah. And and here's the thing, and you said it when you were talking about it. We're not suggesting he won't have a fine NBA career. We're not suggesting he's limited and basketball is not a future. We're just saying you see that body, you see how nimble he is, you see the way he moves in the paint. That is offensive lineman footwork, man. That all that stuff that he's doing, the drop step, all that stuff, that is that is stuff that that offensive line coaches spend years trying to develop. You see it already with that. Yeah, yeah. You and I aren't NBA scouts. I have no idea what I'm looking at, you know, when it comes to the projection of the to the National Basketball Association. And and I'm sure he could play overseas. There's a lot of basketball probably, but all you and I were on the same page. Like it's the whole curiosity thing is what would it look like with pads on? That's all it was. That's all it is. Now, what would it take then from this stage going from now, put on your front office hat, say they lose or they win, say they win, Fine. you know, whatever they be. I think they, who does NC state play? No, they play Purdue. So it's him and Zach Eady, which I am excited to see. Yeah, that's uh, gonna say, be fun. Let's say they lose on Saturday. And let's say he has a pro day. What, what would be the workout you would put him through if you were to be the person who was at the pro day and wanted to actually see him do football exercises? Yeah. Uh, great question. It's going to have to happen quickly. Um, you know, with NIL stuff, I'm sure he has an agent. Now that's probably not an NFL certified agent contract agent. I'm sure there's a lot of those guys right now that might be scrambling to get away to, uh, to DJ Burns right now. Uh, but it's going to, ha- it would have to come together quickly because we got the draft here in, you know, less than a month. Uh, but I would try to do all like a full workout I'd run a 40, do the shuttles bench press. I don't know. The guy probably hasn't been lifting a bunch in season, although teams would love to know how strong he is. I yeah. mean, that's going to be, that's a big component of it as well. Height and um, weight, right? You'd measure him. Oh yeah. You'd, you, you'd certainly measure him. You would do all, you know, a three cone, short shuttle, vertical, broad jump, 40 yard dash, all like standard pro day stuff. 
and then just have him go through an offensive line position workout. I've seen people say, well, what about tight end? That doesn't look like a tight end body type to no. me. But I would have him slide and, and, you know, redirect and pass set and, you know, get out on pole, see him open his hips up and get out and run, um, all that stuff. I'd see him, you know, pop a bag and, and see. Now, I did hear that he has played football. And that's Eighth another grade. Key. Eighth grade, that's I was told. At least he knows where, you know, thigh pads go in his pants and everything. At least he's put on pads before because the guys that have made the, the you know, the transition successfully, most of them have played. You're going back to like Antonio Gates and, and Jimmy Graham, like those guys have played football in high school. So, so we would see, but it would be fun. But yeah, I would put him through just a normal standard pro day workout. Yeah. I'm trying to think of some like, guy, like, do you remember Quentin Rollins played point guard at Miami of Ohio? And then the, I think the Packers draft him in the second or first round as a corner. Like there's been guys who have played high levels, obviously at both. And we can go through the NFL history of, of, you know, whoever it is, there's a long litany of guys that have played it, but I, you know, I look back at like Vita Vea had a very, like very decorated high school basketball career. Quentin Nelson, I believe went to Red Bank Catholic or Red Bank Regional in New Jersey and was like an all-state player. Like it's not unprecedented for guys who played high school ball to then make the transition. What is unprecedented is to not play any college football. And yet, right. but you tell me, Jordan Maialata didn't play a snap of football his entire life and got drafted, wasn't just an undrafted guy by the Eagles in the seventh round and is now one of the best offensive tackles in the sport. Cause Jeff Stoutland coaches him up. Yep. No, he, he came to mind yesterday. Uh, I have done a couple podcasts and, and radio shows like you talked about. My, my lot of came up. He's, he's, he would be a developmental player, right? It would, it would take two or three years probably. And, and what we don't know, the toughness thing is, is probably the biggest component that we don't know. Right. Um, and I love some of the Charles Barkley stories about when he went out to play football one day in high school and yeah. coach is like, all right, Charles, we'll see you tomorrow. He's like, no, you won't. I'm all I'm good. good. I'm good. <laughs> I'm not, not doing that anymore. So um, yeah, it's just fun stuff to think about. Uh, Pete Frisco, who is polarizing to many online is one of my favorite guys. Cause he says what he thinks. And Pete's just <laughs> always been himself. He's real. He, he said, slow it all down. You know, there's football tough and there's basketball tough and we have no idea if he's football tough. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Pete, Pete nailed it. Yeah. That's a big, that's a big part of it. And again, a lot of these projections have been tight ends. A lot of these projections that have hit have been, you know, the Mo Wiley Cox is the Jimmy Grahams. Yeah. Um, that's a different position. You can flex those guys out, right. And make those guys pass catchers. I mean, if, if DJ Burns hits, he would hit as an offensive lineman and, and there are there are more finesse tackles than 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 others, and there's power players, but it's not, there's there's a it, there's an element of physicality regardless if you're, if you're on the line of scrimmage. So that that is the great unknown. Your buddy who lives in that area was trying to keep it quiet. Do you think there's a lot of those in the draft, or there's like, hey, this is a little undercover gem that no one else has that that I know, and we're not going to publicize it, but might not be on the radar and plays basketball. Like, is there someone dedicated to that at each team? I don't know how front offices work, but someone put a tweet out who said, ah, I forget what team it might've been Denver or new England. And it was like, since 2022, this guy's been hired and his job is to look at all college basketball players and try to find the guys, you know, the, the square for the round peg that maybe the, the sport is wrong and we can match him up and get him to football. Is there, is that a dedicated job in a front office? Um, I've never known it to be a dedicated job. That's a really good question. Um, you know, speaking to the guy that, that's up there, I mean, when they're in your backyard, you might take your take your kid to a basket, college basketball game and notice them or something like that. But these NFL scouts don't have a lot of time to be on watching college basketball on television. That's 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 one thing. I'll say this after I want to say it might have been after maybe after the Mo Ali Cox year and we had him up to Seattle. Um, one of the guys in our department in Seattle, you know, one of the upper level guys assigned it to all the scouts. They broke up the country uh, by area scout and did a comprehensive study of, you know, I don't know how he did it. I don't know how analytically he broke it down, like what level of basketball player they had to be statistically. I, I don't know how he found him, but he ran searches of guys that did play high school football that were also like starting level basketball players. And uh, we had to make calls. We had to make calls to the basketball programs at schools, which was really weird that year, you know, to be reaching out to like directors of basketball operations. Those were calls I was used to used to making. Um, and I don't know if they still do that, but I know at least for a couple of years up in Seattle, we did that. I love that because um, it shows look, thinking outside the box and creativity. I, 
being a football, you know, media guy, I'm not gonna say I'm a football guy, but a football media guy, there was always this sensitivity where they'd be like, well, if Allen Iverson played football, he would be the best, or, or Randy, not Randy, if LeBron James played wide receiver, he'd be the best wide receiver of all time. And time and time again, football people would say, slow down, you know? Is there a threat almost to the football community when you hear someone like me tweet out DJ Burns could be an offensive tackle in the NFL? Like, is it insulting to those who dedicate their lives to the position? Peter, it shouldn't be. And you are a football guy, dude. You sat down Thank here at you. our 75th anniversary <laughs> thing and just re- you re- you knew the you knew all our 75th guys career highlights and everything. You're your football guy. Um, it shouldn't be threatening. And, and you know, to the LeBron thing, like I, I'll talk about Jimmy Graham a little bit. So. Okay. I scouted Jimmy Graham when he was coming out of Miami. They had three tight ends that year. I think one was Clive Warford. I can't remember who the other guy was, but they were all good players. Yeah. Um, I was there in August, and we're watching an edge set drill, beginning of practice. You know, pads are popping. You know, it's basically tight end against against defensive end, and Jimmy's getting ragdolled all over the place. Um, and there was a longtime scout, Joe Collins, from the New York Giants. <laughs> He's retired now. I love Joe. And he looked over at me and he was like, he's like, that basketball player is going to be the best one. And I'm like, Joe, the guy that's just getting tossed around right now is going to be the best one. And then they broke that drill. They, they went off and did like seven on seven or, or, uh, you know, routes on air with the quarterbacks. And then you saw Jimmy, you know, move and, right. and break. And I was like, okay. I, I looked at Joe. I'm like, you might be onto something. And he was like, Jim, I cheated. I was here yesterday for practice. Too. He saw it. He saw him dominating. But, yeah. But, but think about this. So Jimmy Graham has, you know, kind of a, a borderline hall of fame career. Yeah. Who knows what I saw a tweet the other day. Like what, what, what would Jimmy's career look like if the saints never traded him to Seahawks totally. uh, from, for Max Unger, if he stayed with, with Drew Brees, his whole career, what would his numbers look like? He's again, regardless, he's one of the best players in saints history. Right. Um, so, and he was a dirty work player for the Miami basketball team. He was a, he was a sixth man. He wasn't, if I recall, he he averaged like less than 10 points a game, if I'm not mistaken. He was not, he worked on a double zero, if I'm not mistaken. And he was not 20 and 10. No, he was the scrappy guy, dude. He was, he was the blue collar guy. I think he finished at the time off the top of my head. He was like top 10 in blocks in, in career history. Then he was a rebounder and he was a defensive player, but he was like a scrappy dude in the ACC. Like not even touching, he had no chance to play in the national in the NBA. Yeah, what would LeBron have like in in his career ends up being borderline Hall of Fame? Yeah, as a guy that was like a sixth man in the ACC, what would LeBron seriously like? He's he or Michael Jordan, whatever that debate is. Best best basketball player ever. He played he played football in high school and was a and dominant high, level, high school football dominant. player high level. He was probably a legit six seven six eight, probably 260, 70 pounds. He could have been the best football player that ever lived. <laughs> I mean, he dedicated, honestly, right? how, how can you, how can your brain not go there? I mean, if you're just, if you're just using Jimmy Graham as, as the benchmark and what his career in the NFL ended up being, what could LeBron have been? So yeah, back to it. NFL people shouldn't be, they, I mean, come on, you, you, those games are fun to play. Yeah. I don't know if DJ Burns loves football. I don't know if he's ever had a chance to root for, I don't even know. You know, no. we don't know. LeBron loves football lebron i know just through mav carter and those guys like they football's almost you know basketball is the job and the pat but like those guys on sundays that is what they do they watch football so you combine that does a, like did george fant love football or was it like this is a job when you interviewed him and you guys brought him in you know i didn't sit with george then but but for him to have the career he's had i would assume he he, he, he either loved it or really liked it. Yeah, um, I guess my question is like, if you're DJ Burns and your whole life has been basketball, 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 and it's like, yeah, but there's a meal ticket potentially for football. It, do you need to have like a a dying, an undying love for the sport to like pursue it, or is it just, hey, this is this is the right decision financially? I guess that's a decision he's got to make, right? Peter, Peter, you know this. I mean, there's a lot of guys that play in the in, in the NFL that don't love football. Um, that's, we've that's had the countless line. guys on Good Morning Football who, like, I try to talk about the league with, like, in commercial break, and like, they don't even follow the NFL. Like, they don't no. even know who the good teams are. They don't even. And I, I, I'm almost humbled by that. I'm like, that. How? What an amazing athlete you are that you can just do what you do as a job and then like turn it off. That's incredible. You know? Yeah. Like, would those guys? And that's always the first question with guys that played both sports, right? And, and and you hear about it. Like, you go into the school as a scout in the fall, and they'll tell you, like. This kid was more of a hooper in high school. Like, we don't know how much he loves football, but, you know, he's really good at it, so he does it. But what it does, it probably prevents you from hitting your ceiling as a player, right? Like, if you really loved it, then, like, you would be better. 
Um, but just on your natural gifts alone, you can play it. And you can, a lot of these guys play a long time, but that's kind of, I don't think fans realize how many guys just don't love it. Yeah. Uh, my last question on this multi-sport thing. Um, I'll never forget. I want to say it was Tristan Wirfs and there's a long line of them. And, and I know AJ Epineza was one of them. And of course, in recent years, Linderbaum, I'm like wrestling. Football guys love wrestlers. They don't love basketball guys, but they love wrestlers. Am I wrong? You're absolutely right. No, especially, um, you know, on the, on the offensive defensive line. So for this year, Zach Frazier is a center at West Virginia. Yep. I think he was a four time state champion in the state of West Virginia, maybe lost one time as a freshman, ridiculous record. So this is, this is another, a cool carryover. Now you're catching me off guard a little bit, but yeah. during my time, during my time with the Patriots, and I'm going to be blanking on this dude's name. Okay. Um, he was a, he was a, all American wrestler at Cal State Bakersfield. Okay, I'm gonna look this our, up. Our, talk. All right. our college director Larry Cook from the New England Patriots um, went up and went to the workout, went to the pro day, worked him out. We signed him as a free agent, or we drafted him late. I can't remember. I'll tell you his name right now, and he's he's uh, Stephen Neal. He was a great St Patriot. Stephen Neal. I'm I'm sorry, Stephen. I am I'm having like a old guy moment right now. Yeah, yeah. On Stephen Neal. He is CSU but, yeah. Bakersfield's most decorated wrestler, and he now serves as the alumni relations coordinator for CSUB's wrestling program. A once in a lifetime story of wrestler who did not play college football and went into the NFL and had a storied NFL career. Yeah, they don't have they don't have football at Cal State Bakersfield. They don't play football there. So again, he came in. How do you find I, that? So how'd they find him? I, I some agent probably just put it out that they were gonna have a pro day. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know how, but but I'm sure a lot of teams came. Thank God Larry, you know, made, developed a relationship and signed him. But I remember the biggest thing for Steven was it, it wasn't strength, it wasn't toughness, obviously. His was just that aggressive nature, right? Because you're used to that is such yeah. an aggressive sport. He had to rein himself in a little bit. He had to tone um, it down. Like, like, yeah, tone it down a little bit. On the football field, he would be so over aggressive. He almost, he almost questioned the athlete a little bit because he was always out over his skis and he's, you know, on the ground. And then, you know, but but our offensive line coach Dante Scarnecchia was like, Jim, that's not athleticism. I just we just got to rein this guy in. And then, like you said, he came out. He was an all-time Patriot. I mean, this dude started so many games in a row. Um, and again, it's nice when you have a Dante Scarnecchia, one of the greatest coaches ever, uh, to help develop you. But I mean, obviously different sport, but there's another, there's another instance where the guy didn't play college football, you know, becoming a, a very good NFL player. Yeah. I remember I used to do games with Matt Millen. I was his sideline reporter and Matt loved, loved college and high school, Pennsylvania, Penn state wrestling. And he would, he would say, always give me a wrestler, like, give me a wrestler, get me someone who's going to get dirty. And I was like, that's so interesting. Cause those two sports, like when you get those big boys, like it, a lot of those skills do translate. Uh, you mentioned the Patriots. I'm going to get you off script a little bit here. You worked there for many years. Did you get a chance to watch the documentary, the dynasty? Uh, I did. I did. I saw, I think I've seen the first four episodes so far, which was your um, era, right? That's when you were with them through those. First yeah. The, those first four episodes was about the time I was there. I actually caught myself in the, in the background of a couple practice shots and I felt really old cause I looked yeah. a lot younger back then, but, uh, look good. but uh, it was, it was really cool. Okay. Really cool. Because obviously you've seen a lot of the, I would say almost this is interesting. I, the Patriots, dynasty i almost break up into different chapters almost four chapters of like you know the early first four super bowls that they went to you know including the giants one and then this you know change in guard a little bit and then you've got these last 10 years you can split in half of you know the brady you know final couple super bowls and then post brady um a lot of a lot of controversy around it and even robert Kraft at the league meetings had to like speak up on it and was like well i'm not necessarily thrilled which i I'm not going to knock Robert Kraft from what he thought of it, but I believe he had production, you know, say in some of this stuff and, you know, he was kind of being critical of it. Have you talked to like, is this a, is there a text chain of all the old Patriot staffers with like you and Nick Casario and Eric Mangini and whoever else like texting about how the thing was portrayed? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. We've, uh, I've had, I've had some of those texts with some guys. Um, again, I, I wasn't in it. I'm sure the guys that are in are a little more hypersensitive to it. And you know what I do with the, with the Patriots dynasty there, Peter? I break it down to the slot receivers. To me, it was the Troy Brown era, and this. then it was the Wes Welker era, and then it was the Julian Edelman era. To me, those are the those three guys kind of span the lifetime. But I don't know. It, for me, it was like a look back. You know, I saw Damian Woody put something out there on social media that he was watching it with his kids, 
you know, they obviously weren't around when Damian was a player. Sort of like see footage of him running out the tunnel at, at, at Gillette and all those things. Like for me, it was like a retrospective, man. I was in like my mid twenties back then. I'm almost 50 now. So, so that. I, I watched the show through, through that lens and it just brought back a lot of great memories. And, um, I thought they did a great job, but shoot, man, I'm not, I was I know. no part of that content. So the I, I chief, know there's a lot, I know there's a lot of people that have issues with it though. So like the chief concerns are that like, you know, Corey Dillon comes uh, about as a, you know, not a troubled player, but a guy that just hadn't been able to win and was on the field, off the field, whatever for the Bengals. Like that was a big Bill Belichick move to bring in Corey Dillon. Like, like Eric Blunt was like a, a lot of the stories of guys that Belichick took a gamble on. And Randy Moss is obviously, was less of a gamble given the the player that he was that stuff was lost and some of belichick's gumption to say you know what let's throw um convention to the wind and let's let's try to win football like, there's a feeling that belichick wasn't portrayed as well as he should have been as being one of the greatest coaches of all time if not the greatest yeah i mean yeah the greatest i i could see that i mean there's so there's so many great things that that bill and scott did putting those teams together Kind of going out of limb. I mean, even like Rodney Harrison. I remember mm -hmm. when when they when they brought in Rodney Harrison. Um, you know, I think Marty Schottenheimer was on record saying that, or maybe told Rodney this, and it got back to me through through someone in the front office that, like, they told Rodney, man, you you lost a step. Like, we can't, we don't, we don't think you got it anymore. Wow. So then you bring in a dude with a chip on his shoulder, and and all Rodney did, I remember, I remember this stat vividly. In six in a six six playoff game run, he forced seven turnovers. He <laughs> created. Whether like force fumbles, interceptions, fumble recoveries, he was a part of seven turnovers in six playoff games, which to me is like the coolest stat ever. You know, you bring in guys that play big and big games. But uh, yeah, I mean, I shoot. Uh, I know. I, I haven't know. finished it. I look forward to finishing it. I haven't um, either. I've gotten six episodes in. I just finished the Aaron Hernandez episode. And I think that's what a lot of the Patriots are like. Yeah, that was a story in CNN and it was a bigger story in our building. But like, if you're going to encapsulate 10 years of the Patriots is it or 20 years of the Patriots and 10 episodes, like, I don't know. And a lot of them, I know that like Rodney was upset because he did five hours of interviews and they got one clip in with him. I know Devin McCourty through Jason wasn't thrilled. They spent all day with him multiple days. And you know, that's, that's really behind the scenes stuff. Like for us, the viewers, like, it's candy to just watch old football and the greatness <laughs> of the Patriots for be honest. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. Before we wrap, we're now April 2nd. Where are teams with their draft boards? Like has Washington likely decided, okay, here's how we rank our quarterbacks. Or is that thing still fluid as they gather information? I think it's still fluid. Um, I was in Baton Rouge last week in uh, it was, it was, it was pretty cool because at the hotel we stayed at in Baton Rouge, Dan Quinn and Adam Peters were there. Um, and then Gerard Mayo and Elliot Wolf were there. We're all down in the lobby um, getting ready to go to Jaden Daniels pro day the next day. You know, we're having, having drinks down there and, and he's going to be on one of their two football teams yeah. <laughs> probably yeah. uh, when we get to the fall. So, you know, they're just coming off that, right? They most most of the teams let their their families go home and have Easter with the family. And now they're bringing them all back in. So now what you're doing, you, they, most of these teams haven't met since um, post Senior Bowl. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they have not met since the combine because you hit the ground running from the combine to pro days, right? Yep. So like their last their last meeting was, OK, let's let's debrief after Senior Bowl. How did all these guys look? Now let's go to the combine. Now they got to get back together. Okay. What did combine look like? What did pro days look like? What's the new information? You know, again, I think the lost part of pro day season is, yeah, you're, you're there to get the numbers and see how the guys work out, but it's another opportunity for these scouts to go back into the buildings and not just meet with the player, but meet, you know, resource the building. Like we, we've now we've met with the guy, we met with him in, in mobile. We met with him at the, at the pro day. Here's the questions we have left. Now you go back to the offensive coordinator or, you know, the cat, the custodians or whatever, you know, the equipment guy, whatever questions you have yeah. left, you can work, you can work the building again. So now they're all getting back in the building. Now you're talking through all that stuff over probably the next two weeks. And then those final two weeks, it's just phone calls, you know, working strategy, working trades um, and trying to really get the strategy part of the draft down is probably those final two weeks. But right now they are, they're just debriefing after, you know, combine and pro days. So there okay. to long way, long windedly answer you, Peter. I think I think I don't think the commanders or the Patriots or or any of those teams really know, you know, who their guy is yet. 
Okay, here's an exercise we're going to do because I think, honestly, Daniel Jeremiah, I think, is the best on TV. I think if we threw you on there, you'd be right up there with Daniel. And I think you've got as great an insight as anyone having been, you know, the executive director of the Senior Bowl for all these years. But also, you, you're just great in talking about these players in terms we can understand. I'm going to do a little game with you, and you can play along or just say, hey, Peter, I don't want to do this. Uh, I'm going to name the quarterback and I'm going to say my concern with them. And then you're going to tell me whether it's a valid concern or say what you've heard about these guys with that concern. We good. Yeah. Great. Jaden Daniels, his size and his build is too big of a concern to take at number two in the draft in that if Bryce young showed us anything, and I know Bryce young is shorter, build wise Daniels might not be bigger than 200 pounds. Um, that build is not one that will last in the NFL. Your thoughts on that comment. Okay. I, I think if, and this is, this is whole poking season, right? We're yes, it is. Um, so if that's the hole, it's a really small hole to poke. Um, you know, Jaden, I think a lot was made of what he was at Arizona state. He's this slight build guy. He's gotten bigger and bigger. Has so, he? Okay. I love yeah. that. At Baton Rouge last week, I'm sitting in the auditorium in the team room uh, when Brian Kelly addressed all the, the NFL guys, and I'm sitting next to the LSU strength coach, um, and they, they weigh all the players in front of the assembly, and Jaden was 210. Okay. And I, I looked over at the strength coach. I'm like, is that what he played at in the fall? Is that the heaviest he's been? He's like, no, he, he was 212, 213. Okay. Tom Brady ended his career when he was when he's going through all the TB12 stuff. I, I read places where he was like 215 pounds, Okay, you know, and, and nobody questioned that. So if, if Jaden's in that 210 to 215, he didn't get hurt in the SEC. He took a lot of big shots yeah, he in did. the SEC too. And if you look at his, you look at the games played and games missed, student mi didn't miss a lot of time in the most physical league no. in college football. So I, I think that's a, a small hole to poke. Interesting. He didn't measure at the combine to you. Is that a red flag? Yeah, I mean, it's just I don't I don't know what the, I don't know what these guys are doing now and what the agents are telling me. Like, yeah. why not remeasure? Or why not? It's yeah. just again, it, it's probably stupid. It's probably dumb. I, I get where the agents and the players are like, listen, I measured at the Senior Bowl, I measured at the Combine. Like, why do I have to do it again? But uh, I mean, I that, that's not going to get them drafted or undrafted, or I don't think it's it's not going to move the needle with teams. Okay, Drake May inaccurate for the first year. What are your talk? What are your takes on that? The the inaccuracy part. Okay, I would say uh, a lot of times accuracy stems from your feet. Okay. Um, and Drake was working out down here in Mobile in the pre-draft process uh, with a guy by the name of David Morris. It was Bo Nix um, and Drake May and Carter Bradley who has a chance of getting drafted, like yeah. Gus, Brad Gus Bradley. Senior guy. Yep. Yeah. So. Um, Watching them work out, we go back in. I watched the field workout. We go back in. We watch video, and they took a video. And so it's kind of close up, and I'm watching Drake throw, and I'm like total idiot. I don't even think about the May family and what they are. Yeah. I look at Drake. I'm like, did you play hoops growing up? And he was like, yeah, I did. And I'm like, well, did you play through high school or did you stop in middle school? He's like, no, I played all the way through. And then someone was like, well, Jim, like his whole family played hoops in North Carolina. I'm like, I totally forgot. I got that. it. Yeah. His He's brother had the great... big game winning shot that time. Yeah. Yeah. This dude, this dude for a guy, his size, he has incredible feet. Okay. Um, so is there things he can do mechanically, you know, in terms of like shortening the release to tighten that up? Absolutely. And again, obviously everyone points to Josh Allen is, is a yeah. guy that you can correct some inaccuracy stuff with. I just think when they're athletic enough, like Josh Allen, we all know what kind of athlete he is. Drake May is a similar type of athlete. Um, I mean, his feet are really bouncy for a big guy. So it, it would not be a concern of mine. All right. Last one. JJ McCarthy, 18 teammates at the combine and Sharon Moore called 32 straight run plays in a game and he didn't throw the ball <laughs> once. Um, is that a red flag to you? No, that's that's Sharon Moore in a really hostile visiting environment at Penn State wanting to just assert his will on the other team. So that's what I would say, you know, and yeah, did JJ have a lot of great players around him? He certainly did. But he didn't have, I mean, look at look at who Jaden Daniels at, threw the neighbors and Thomas, right? I mean, like neighbor, those are neighbors two top wideouts. No question. I mean, you, you just go back over some of these quarterbacks and who they were throwing to. Even Joe Casey, Burrow had Chase and Jefferson, right? Right. And Mac Jones had, you know, Devontae Smith and Waddle and 
all those guys, Judy and yeah. all those guys. So, um, and JJ didn't have that. JJ, JJ didn't have like Roman Wilson's a really good player yeah. and they've got some, they got some young guys, but he didn't have that outside. So, um, again, that's the easy knock. All I know is that JJ has only lost three football games in his life. That includes high school? Uh, high school? Okay. High school and college. The kid has lost three games as a starter. It's a big enough sample size. He's been a two year starter. He's got crazy tools. So I'll share one quick story from Pro I love Day. this. All right. I met Baton Rouge last week. I'm standing next to a GM. I wasn't at Caleb Williams Pro Day. I wasn't at JJ McCarthy's Pro Day, but this GM was, right? So JJ or uh, Jaden finishes up his workout. I thought it was impressive. Um, the dude can freaking fire it off his hand. I mean, it's, it's really impressive. I'm like, well, where does this stack up in the three you've seen? And his rank was J.J. McCarthy, then Jaden Daniels, then Caleb Williams, just off the pro day. OK, OK. So what, what do pro days show? Pro days show physical tools. They show they show the physical potential of a guy and what he can do, you know, mobility, arm strength, all those things. Right. That's what pro days is about. Physically, what is this guy? Tools. J.J. obviously has them. If a GM has seen those three workouts and he puts them up there as the top guy. So, mm. um I mean, that's why everyone's asked me in some of the podcasts, like, is this JJ McCarthy stuff real? I think it is. You know, I think that I think that the media is playing catch up a little bit. And I think the league's playing. I think the league's diving more into JJ. Yeah. They didn't know if he was going to come out or not. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's it, it's. Uh, so I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I dispelled or you put did. your, put you your great concerns job. to rest. But that's what do you what do you make a hardball? rallying the flag around him so much you're a michigan man like what well, what is that I, when he some comes out and is like he's the number one quarterback in this draft and says all these things like does that to me it's like i roll my eyes a little bit i'm like of course you're his college coach but what, what do you make of that hardball putting his name on it like this is the guy well I, i'll say this and uh, so much respect for for jim harbaugh and what he's done his whole career and he, yeah. he brought a you know brought a national championship to my alma mater which was awesome um, but he's in a great situation right now. He's got Justin yeah. Herbert in his no one's, no one's wondering if he's drafted him at five. So, yeah. so he doesn't have to put his money where his mouth is, right? Like he can say, and I'm sure Jim believes all this stuff. I mean, shoot, you win a national championship with people. You talk to players and coaches. You win, you win a national championship or a Super Bowl with a group of men. Like that's pretty special. And you're going to have special that. feelings about those guys. So I'm sure Jim believes every word he's saying. Um, but again, he doesn't have to draft him now because he, he's got Justin. Okay. I want to talk about the masters with you because you're a golf guy and you might be attending, but uh, maybe we'll do that next week or a week after that. And we'll get the full okay. recap in the, okay. in, in the meantime, uh, keep on doing what you're doing and I'll be following you on Twitter or X, but also I'll be talking with you. Uh, thank you so much for joining. This is really illuminating stuff, especially on DJ Burns and we're less than a month away, dude. And then I know you're already into senior bowl 2025. I know it. We are. Yeah, we started that. But yeah, this was awesome, Peter. Thanks for having me back on. You're the man. Jim Nagy, executive director of Reese's Senior Bowl. And I saw it firsthand, the unofficial uh, mayor of Mobile, Alabama. Thank you, dude. Thanks, man.